Feld is a poet, visual artist, and community arts activist, and a fo focusing coach. After spending 25 years in the corporate world, managing and mentoring teams and coordinating projects, he moved over to writing poetry and teaching art and providing programs for community involving both art and poetry, and also mentors students in math and uh, other artistic endeavors. Uh, upcoming event involves collaborative drawing workshop within his community, which involves improvising and collaboration in a safe, right or wrong, free environment. He works closely with the mayor's office in Newton and directs projects that connect poets with wider audience, for instance, in posting a number of poems uh, from poets, uh, not posting them, but having them uh, appear on stones uh, in the Edmonds Park, uh, and also poetry that shows up by local poets when it rains on the sidewalks, I believe, in the Boston area. Um, and he also has his own art on exhibit in museums and galleries nationwide. Gray is a recipient of the National Endowment for the Arts Fellowship in Creative Writing. He has two of his books of poetry published, including um, Spilled Milk and Two Star General, and a third is on its way, Work a Day. And he is here today to share some of his poetry that he has from his books with you. So please give a warm welcome to Gray Held. Here's a good time, right? Thank you. Thank you, Cheryl, for that introduction, and thank you for all the noticing that you talked about when you were uh, giving your introduction this morning. It's really admirable to go around with that level of just noticing what's around, so that's a nice place to start with. I'm going to read from uh, a little bit from my book called Spilled Milk. It's a book that focuses on parenting and marriage. And I'll start with a poem called Power Struggle. Let me do it, he yells. I take coins from my pocket, let him count out the quarters, three, four. I pick him up so he can slide the money in. He pushes the buttons, K, I whisper, 10, I whisper. Out tumbles the package of peanut butter crackers he grabs from me yanks the little red string that opens the wrapper that falls. At the table, he unglues the top half of a sandwich, scrapes the peanut butter off with his teeth, his tongue, polishing the cracker into the soggy circle he hands to me. Your half, he says, and I take it. To-do list. One, give them enough rope to make a triple fisherman's knot that should not, but will most likely come undone. Two, teach them to value a man by the width of the path he hews with his scythe. Three, tell them not to falter or get lost. Show them which door to take. Four, point out the barbed wire around the chicken coop. Make of it an example of how sometimes an idea itself can cut you. Five, show them hope can be sufficient. Map of the Blue Hills, Torn. This is where we filled the green canteen with 20 tadpoles. This is where I made a fire for him inside a moat of stones. This is the meadow where he begged, let's wrestle. I pinned him, my chest pressed to the hull of his little ribs. I tried not to hurt him, and it was hard to throttle my strength, hard to keep from frightening him like that water moccasin did, 
pouring itself out at the switchback. Hard to maintain a father's radar that says a wrist is twisting. He wants to lock me in the willful hinge of his elbow, so I let him. The irrevocable slope of my knee wax his nose. On the map, his blood is smudged across the black, staggered dashes of the trail on which I wanted to know the topography of everything possible. So now I'll read some from um, my book, Two Star General. Um, and I think it's appropriate that this is Veterans Day. And Cheryl, I liked what you said about honoring uh, our ancestors, so I'd like to just take a moment to thank my father for his service in World War II and his brother, my uncle, and my grandfather, Jack, uh, as well as his brother, David, and his brother, Joshua, who died 100 years ago today in World War I trying to free a comrade that was stuck in barbed wire. So, thank you. My dad didn't talk a lot about um, being in the war. He was chief of supply on General MacArthur's staff in the Pacific uh, for much of the war. He was responsible for being sure that there was enough food and munitions and supplies for the soldiers in that uh, arena. So I tried to imagine what it was like. The first part of the book is an imagining of what it was like on a day-to-day -day basis for my dad. Uh, so this is an imagining. Sleepless. On the army cot, I kissed the palm of my own hand, wishing it were my sweetheart. I missed the way her instinctive fingers could amaze her Steinway. One note rising, one note kneeling. I have been two years, five months gone, and I am reduced to sappiness. Chalk from the blackboard in the planning room has dusted my heart on my sleeve. Inventory. Two hours left of kerosene. Men in the gut, mud in the guts of all four tires of my Jeep. Bent fender, left headlight refusing to shine. The barracks window, a corporal with one shoe on and one shoe off, moonlight. A cigarette pack in the pocket I've made of a rolled up sleeve. 48 stars on the blue field of the flag that sleeps on a pole above the docks and the wrist-thick ropes that lash the transports. 20,000 men at the mercy of a meager reef. Ashes in the pit dug for cooking. The stew with meat I tell them is bird, but isn't. Eulogy. I talk about Sergeant Godfrey's spine. That little bump, the freckle on his shoulder that looked like scat. I talk about his scorpion tattoo, his thumb twisted leftward by the slam of a turret latch. There was blood and there was bone. He never, never flinched. When he stacked sandbags, he'd pat each one as if it were a dog. Once I saw him find a lamb hobbling into camp, and for that lamb, he made a splint of chamois cloth. Ramrod, twine. The second part of the book is, is my dad, uh, as I knew him. Um, he had brought home a map that he had used in the Pacific. Um, and this is a story about that. It was plastered on our bedroom wall. My father's map. Our father's six by 10 foot map of the world that used to hang over his desk in army headquarters in Manila was pasted across our bedroom wall. I slept with my head near Malaysia. My brother slept under Brazil. 
The colors of that map were coded by elevation, the same colors our mother used to decorate our room. And so my orange bedspread matched the Himalayas. Our sheets were white as Antarctica was white. The curtains were the same yellow as the Russian tundra. Some nights our father would tell us stories about the map, the prick holes where he'd pushed pins in to chart the progress of destroyers in the Pacific, a circle penciled around Nagasaki, another circle, Hiroshima, shipping routes in big red arcs from port to port, a stain, he said, where he'd coughed coffee over the coast of Madagascar, not far from the blot where he'd slept a mosquito dead. Time changed the names of things. Transjordan ditched the trans to be just Jordan. The French Sahara stopped answering to France. Belgian Congo wasn't Belgian anymore. Between my brother's twin bed and my twin bed, there was always an imaginary buffer zone, starting at Tanganyika and ending at the closet door. Home of the brave. The general has broken his toe. He grimaces, flinches, holds his foot, hops on one leg, and my mother, who is scissoring a strip of surgical tape to marry the bone to its closest neighbor, starts to laugh, huge laughter, until tears drag rivulets of eyeliner down her cheeks. And my father, who rarely seems happy, seems happy, almost proud even, at his own expense, to have brought her this raucous bauble of pleasure. Balance is the riddle. In his sagging canvas chair, he is leaning sideways to pick his shoes up off the sand. I take my father's wingtips from him. Sunlight creases the war scar on his forearm, that skin gone thin as an eyelid. He cannot bend, so I kneel to lift his frail shin, cradle his cracked heel like a single parenthesis in my lap. I ease my fingers back behind the crisscross eyelet, ladders of those shoes. I tighten the laces, loop them into double knots. I align the ribs of his white cotton socks, fold them down just once, like he was a child. Veterans Day Parade. On the marble steps of the public library, he waves a dime store flag. He's worn his medals on the dress uniform he's shrunk from. I stand behind him dutifully. Again, he talks the difficult logic of the Philippines, the munitions and the provisions, his mapped out plans. Along comes a glittering of majorettes well drilled in the semaphore of pom-poms. My father's knees go slack and I steady him, my hand on his elbow, because I want him to stay and watch the unknown soldiers float, sheathed in wreaths. Watch the low-flying squadron of F-14s split the sky. Drizzle turns rain. Time to go. Time to walk through the cortege of black umbrellas beneath which my two-star general cries. Um, after the war, my father was recommended for promotion to general. He was actually a full colonel during the war. Um, and usually with such a recommendation, it's just a matter of course. It happens automatically. But that said, the senator from the state from where you live, and my dad lived in Virginia, uh, by senatorial privilege can block that paperwork from going up to the White House for signature. And as the story goes, Harry Byrd, who was the senator at the time in Virginia and was um, massively resistant to racial integration, used his privilege to block my father's promotion because my father had promoted blacks, quite a few blacks, to officer on his staff. 
Years later, Governor Wilder, the first black governor of Virginia, got wind of this through a mutual friend, and uh, he, he promoted my father to general in the Virginia, Virginia militia, so um, that's a little background to this story. That's this poem that I'm going to read next called Generalized. <clears throat> The night my father finally got his stars, the cold sky tightened to gunmetal, and the tin roof of the Virginia governor's veranda nailed sound waves into hail. All of us were there to see. Next day, the barber thumbtacked the new general's picture to the wall beside the coat rack. The gardener offered to shear the general's boxwoods into stars. But my father put that velvet case of silver stars in his sock drawer didn't wear them in the Veterans Day parade. At 83, he seemed to grieve the honor, General. Even now, even how we generalized him into a rouged up Zeus on a throne of clouds. His rank advancement healed no wound because it came 40 years too late. No heat from that second war. Just rust in the army copter my father used to land in zones outside the haze of segregation that kept other officers, but not him in 1945, from promoting black soldiers up the chain. Discharged. He is sleeping the sleep of spent shells in a room where a monitor throbs. My father be tranced off axis, no code words left. Go home, I say to my family, and take the shift from midnight to bird call. It wasn't that I had particulars to say in a dim lit room when he couldn't answer back. It wasn't forgiveness I was after, or blessing I craved, or the fleur du mal. Just that I wanted to see his soul rise up and pause at a minimum distance like a hovercraft does. I wanted to tremble or cry, turning the air to water. I'll never be able to swim. But it was nothing mythic, no sound at all, just that I bent over his dying and saw he had no pulse, and I never got to bless his body with rags of fire and a rootstock broom. Death of the General. The stone in his throat softens, and the thousand ways to falter condense. The story of his life sheds its early letdown, his lips blister like a fence, and the dog that lived inside that fence makes peace with something. The face falls apart like sandstone, offers up a new profile to the sky, and the mouth opens to let what's pent up through. I take off his false coat, put on this shroud, stitched from thunder, buttoned into mud. Salute. His grave sight, a kind of orthodoxy that won't wash clean. 21-gun salute. Brass shell droppings on tended grass. The slow unfold, the slow folding of the flag that masks the casket. Funereal flowers that stand at attention, chrysanthemums opening their show, roses like pleasure boats. Once my father was a harbor I could name, Manila, Nagasaki. Long ago, he taught me to ride a bike, took hold of the handlebars, his head bent down so close, the steady traffic of his breath chilled me. Don't stop, he said. I wanted to keep taking momentum from him down the entire pathway, so tricky with twigs and stones. Now I want to decide what colors the walls of his mausoleum will be. Ivory white, minimal eggshell, benevolent. Let me set to work nailing, though nothing can be fixed or taught to care. Rafters happen the way rafters do. Gable, gambrel, mansard, 
flat. Let me stack local field stones by their natural math, make a path ascending through bramble, fell the tree, saw the logs to make a door my father can pass through. My mother, the widow. Mid-December and the doorway is sprigged with mistletoe, berries green in patient containment. Birdseed bird seed fills the feeder, but the warblers don't want to eat. At the kitchen table, she's working the New York Times crossword with my father's blue marble fountain pen. I comb her refrigerator for something she needs. The facts. Haven't I spiraled my father's story like moths in the bright funnel of an empty searchlight where everything is found to be cause. Even the stars pinned to the sky dome at the Hayden Planetarium are there at the whim of the projectionist and his off-on switch. I have stitched my father into riffraff and flourish that won't breathe quantifiably. Even if I deconstruct every assumption, won't I think what I think? And after thinking, truth will have changed. Thank you very much. The seed was flung a long ago and form became a hollow shell. As sickles swung across each row, fruit and stalk separating. Strip remnant stray the swaths and solitary blades, wisp the air with foreign tunes, unversed in reminiscing. Refugee stubble, corpse pale, pall bearing, funneling downward staring, skeletal parts, scourged by harvest rays, seared by summer blaze, charred ground, burnt umber, bone ash in the clearing. Only the cedar line holds the summer's guild, burnished on its somber green, like a row of reverend gentlemen retiring in, retiring in rusted brocade, waistcoats, watch pockets ticking, muttering rays of cigar smoke, the dark, the cold, the mortal truce in close branching spaces. There's an edge on things, apart from the opening expanse, an aureole charged with the last intensities, familiar with what is to be. I don't think anything in my poetry life has meant more than doing, doing that. My first poetry mentor, right? This is called Crone Song. It's really hard to choose just one to read. Crone Song. Now is the time for me to pardon the lives that were or might have been and celebrate the life that is, pledging my love to a world that lies at hand, I shall live round like seasons, circling out and back, now free, now bound, then free again, learning to dance, to bring my own soul's offering. I shall live close to earth, Trusting in birth and other new beginnings, I shall reap strength from all those years of bending and reach for grace to ease and bless the ending.
I'm, I'm not sure if you know what a didgeridoo is, but it's basically, it's a tree that was growing and the termites ate the middle out of it. And the aboriginals go around and they knock on the trees until they find a hollow one. They cut it off, put a little beeswax on it, flap their lips and you get a sound from it. Peach and pear.